That's it? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, is it 2.05 officially or not? I don't have 2.05. It is 2.05? Okay, all right. Um, so thank you again uh, to the FDRS for inviting me to speak, and thank you uh, especially Cheyenne for picking another interesting topic for me. Uh, I think one year I talked on um, how do doctors, how come doctors don't treat patients that have a weight problem properly and how they ignore them. One time I talked about herbal medications, one time about uh, how come doctors don't know anything about lipedema, and I don't know what else you had me talk about. Now forming a support group, and I guess you knew, we had formed a support group about a year ago, but I don't think I knew anything about how to form one when we formed it, so I learned a lot with this talk. And these are my disclosures. Now, just a couple things. Um, are any of you here? Uh, this is last year's group picture. And um, I don't know what happened to the hats. When I was trying to think of something, you know, uh, Karen has all these SAT things and uh, terminology. I couldn't think of anything for HAT, so hat. Um, but anyways, a hat group. Uh, but how many, are any of you in support groups here? For, got a few hands there, yeah, good. Um, and um, how many of you have experienced anxiety over your illness? You don't have to raise your hands. Uh, stress, felt uncomfortable, been uh, ignored by your physician uh, or your medical care specialist or had some depression over uh, your problem. And so um, that's what support groups, I think, are for, to help us cope with uh, our daily life activities. So support groups, or self-help groups, are groups of people who gather to share common problems and experiences associated with a particular problem, or, if, or in this case, illness, or personal circumstance, as you can see here with this lady with lipedema. And with, this is where people are able to talk with others who are like themselves, people who truly understand what they are going through and can share insights that can only come from personal or firsthand experience. Now, this is made up of peers, people who are all directly affected by a particular issue. In our case, obviously, it would be lipedema patients. Usually, you have a professional or a volunteer a discussion leader, and they tend to be small in size, and attendance is not mandatory. It is voluntary. It has to be that way. You can't make people come to a support group and have them feel that they're uh, wanted or, or that they must attend, I guess would be the way to, to put it. So why should you form a social uh, or support group? Well, social support plays a huge role in who recover from illnesses, who use healthcare effectively, who enjoy good health, both mentally and physically, and even how long people live. So joining a social or having good social support can affect your health uh, in many different ways. And it's a term that refers to the caring and potential caring of what uh, caring we feel from those around us. Now, why form a support group? Um, the natural occurring, according to the author here, which is Putman in his book, The Collapse and Revival of the American Community, the natural occurring supports, uh, social support we enjoy in our family and community life in the United States has steadily declined uh, over the last 50 years in quantity and quality, so it's declining. And he also documents a steady decline in many of the ways we connect with each other in community activities in volunteerism, in time spent together, in charitable giving, in involvement in com community service, and even in religious organizations. Again, seems to be fading. In addition, we are less likely to interact with our neighbors, feel less uh, likely to talk to them or meet with them, less likely to see them not as good people in some cases, and less likely to trust them as we might have done 50 years ago. So social support that is so important to our individual and community wellness is in much shorter supply than it used to be. So over the same time period that community con connections across the United States have been declining, the number of people who join support groups or peer support groups have been growing dramatically. And here you see the Lippy Chicks and Lipedema Support Group in Ontario, the Shall Group, S-H-A-L-L, -L. I don't know what that stands for, I won't even try, but that's from Utah, a group from Utah. And I think this is Dr. Wright's group, is, is that right, Supp support group, anyone here from 
him because when you go online, you find his picture all over the place. And uh, <laughs> so I wonder if he was part of that group. He's not here to defend himself. So uh, anyway, support groups seem to have been growing uh, dramatically. So again, why form a support group? Well, for help in your particular problem, and obviously support, advice, uh, tips, guidance, and assistance, some of the reasons. So how do you form a support group? You just say, well, we're gonna form a support group. That's what Ann and I, I don't know if Ann's here in the audience. Ann, are you here? Yeah, that's what uh, she and I, I decided. We just said, let's form a support group. And again, I'm gonna go through all these things, and Ann, you're gonna just say, why didn't we do some of these? But Ann did most of the work, so, and, uh, but anyways, how do you form one? I, I guess I didn't think you had to know things about it. You just say, let's, let's get together and talk. And there's a little bit more than that. So these are eight easy steps that you can use to uh, form a support group. One, get motivated. Certainly Ann had that. Form a core group. She did that as well. Find a location. I think I got credit, but she arranged it. So um, get a sponsor. I'm not sure how to define sponsor. We'll try to do that. Bring in members. She's done that. I think I've helped her there. And uh, she planned our first meeting. And then expand your resources and then keep it going. So we actually started this, um, I think it's been, almost, has it been over a year, Ann? Yeah? Yeah, like a year in January, something like that. And um, so to get motivated, well, what are the reasons for starting a group? And did we really have a reason? I think we had a few reasons. We you know, see people with lipedema and they have lots of concerns and there's not a lot of information for them. And so that was one of the reasons I thought maybe that would be a good reason. And many of them have been, as many of you have been, um, ignored and misdiagnosed. So maybe a support group would help at least to inform patients more about lipedema. So that's one of the reasons. And then have a clear set of objectives. And maybe one would just be to educate the patients that come in, the new people that join the group, but also family members. Sometimes a family member will come and you know, maybe your spouse or your partner or another member of the family really doesn't think or doesn't know much about lipedema or doesn't understand it. And, um, you know, that may be another reason. And maybe discuss management and treatment options that are available like we're hearing today. And then what works for some might not work for another, but that works for patient A, patient A might not work, but it may also help patient B or C. And then discuss the needs uh, and the preferences of the attendees. Find out what they would like to talk about. So, yes, I can instead of no, I can't. And then, of course, ask me about lipedema. Uh, we don't have those badges, but maybe they are available. Are they? Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> so, forming a core group, ask other groups how they got started. Um, you know, we might ask another, um, a different type of group, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, or maybe that wouldn't be the best one, but, uh, <laughs> but that might be one. I mean, they're a very large organization, or um, Rotary Club, for example, or something of that nature. And then look for partners. We have some partners. And then create a mission, which is sort of repetitive of what we already said, but focus, summarizing what the group will provide and how it will help each individual participant. And then have multiple group leaders. Then you have to find a location and time, a central location. Uh, ours is sort of in a suburb of, of Cleveland, and um, it seems to work out pretty well. Um, but you could use, uh, and this is a Cleveland clinic where we meet, um, a library, a hospital, a church, a civic center. You can find a place, and then you arrange for a room. And then evening me meetings usually work best. Most of us work or have other um, activities during the day, but some people don't like to drive at night. So while you're forming your group, maybe develop a carpool also so that that individual who doesn't want to drive, for example, something as simple as a carpool will get them there. And then meet once a month on an assigned date. And of course, try to be punctual, at least as the group leaders, we should be punctual and be there on time. Get a sponsor, uh, a doctor. I think this guy is pretty famous. Uh, uh, he hasn't been to any of our meetings. We're forced to, forced to live with me. But, um, <laughs> but someone who works with lipedema patients, a nurse, a physical therapist. Uh, if you work with a physician who treats lipedema, he or she can help refer patients to the group and speak at meetings. And I'm always emailing Ann with another potential uh, 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 person who could join our meeting. I always ask her if we can first, or I think I don't ask her anymore. I just send the patients uh, on to her. And then she arranges uh, for them to 
uh, get a shout out about the next meeting. It works really well. And then bring in new members, make business cards. We haven't done this, but I put Anne's name on it and her email if you want to join our group. If you live in Tucson, it might be a bit of a trip uh, every a month, but unless you like to come to Cleveland in the wintertime. But make business cards with your contact information on it. Have everyone in the group carry business cards. And I carry my own business card, and I will hand it out to the patient, and I'll scribble Anne's email address on it at that time. And then place the date and time of the meetings. I haven't done that, and we haven't done that that I know of, but everything now is done online, so do you really need paper? And then post your contact and meeting information on the FDRS or other website. Are we allowed to do that? Okay, so here it is. I put it up for you just in case you need that to post your meeting. So again, bring in new members. Uh, and then your first meeting, gather, we gathered at a hospital room, uh, but you could do it at uh, uh, one of uh, the person's home. And I think, Anne, if I remember, your mother had a holiday party with some of the members there, but that wasn't our first meeting. Um, use name tags. I think we started to use name tags uh, the last few meetings. Uh, Karen Herbst, uh, that name would work, um, but um, not necessary for all of us. And then you want your members to be comfortable in the meeting. Make sure that, you know, they don't have, they can stand if they want. I guess they say you can fidget. I'm a little fidgeting here right now, I know that. But you want to get comfortable. And uh, I think we do that. We just kind of don't start out with anything real formal. It's just hello to everyone. Uh, develop a group name. Here's ours. And a nice, isn't that beautiful? Uh, one of, I don't think, she's not a member though, right? She just designed it. Okay, I'm sorry, Sarah, if you're here today, I apologize. But uh, that's beautiful, add a positive if you can't see it. And then prepare uh, materials to give out to the members, uh, like uh, Kathleen's Listen. I think we, somebody brought that book one time for others to look at on uh, therapy. Or uh, the last meeting I think we had, somebody brought uh, a number of books on ketogenic diet for others to look at. So very important, and give the handouts to the, to the members, something that I think we should be able to do a little bit more often. And then expand your resources. Members often bring suggestions to the group, including treatments that have worked for them. For example, Revitative, or however you pronounce it. It's on TV, but um, some of the members have found that very helpful. It's a vibrating device, I think, that you stand on. They are a little expensive, but you know, maybe you can share it with other members. I'm not sure how that would work, but that's certainly one thing that you can do. Uh, you might find, uh, share interesting articles. I think we've shared Karen's article on butcher's broom and selenium uh, with some of our patients. It's an interesting article. Um, we had physical slash occupational therapists. They've come out on two different occasions, or one of the ladies has, and talked about different garments. And there was a great discussion on what works for some. Now, I'm not used to wearing pantyhose, on, and so I'm not much help, or even a below knee support hose. But um, you know, tips on how to get uh, these garments on and what works. And it seems that capris might work real well with below knee support hose. So again, whatever works for one isn't always the best for the other one, but sharing these ideas has been really interesting. And then the last meeting, we talked about nightshade vegetables. Do any of you know about nightshade vegetables? He has a few hands. Now, I don't know if this is really true, but one of our members uh, stopped taking nightshade vegetables and her inflammation went away. Uh, and she was more mobile, and that includes tomatoes and peppers, different colored peppers. So uh, I'd never heard about it, but you know that's why we have these meetings to learn uh, what our members are experiencing. And then uh, if you're going to bring in an article like this one that my fellow wrote uh, a few years ago to hand out, um, it might be a good introductory uh, article for patients that don't know as much about lipedema, but you always want to be careful of where the source is because. There are so many different rumors floating around that what helps uh, patients with lipedema, sometimes it can be confusing. And then you want to keep it going as well. Alternate discussions and speakers. Again, we've had uh, a metabolic physician or who's also an endocrinologist come and speak uh, once and talk about different diets for uh, overweight patients. We've had, again, as I mentioned, the physical therapists, occupational therapists have come a couple times. I think I talked on herbal medications on one occasion uh, and a few other topics. And so we try to alternate what we speak about. But our last meeting, we just kind of had a get together and everyone sat around and talked about things that were important to them and uh, what might help them. And that's when we talked about nightshade vegetables. So uh, support groups can be challenged, however, by slow periods and health or other circumstances that may interrupt the schedule. 
Even if times are tough with your group, if only two or three people are there, don't give up. So I think in January it was kind of cold and wintry. We only had like, three or four people for the physician who came in, um, the endocrine uh, metabolic doctor. It was, you know, we were a little disappointed. Then in February we had 12 or 14 people show up, and I think we've had as many as 16 or 18. So um, you know, not everyone can make every meeting, and we have to understand that. So. And then for many, the support group is one of the few stable events in their life. They get out there and they talk to people with other similar problems. And so we try to avoid canceling our meetings. And then I think Anne has come up with not maybe a yearly calendar, but a six month calendar and sends it out to all the members so that they know in advance. And she's now taken to make sure I know in advance because I think I missed a meeting in maybe, was it January or February? Or, uh, maybe it was March. Anyways, one of those meetings I completely forgot about, even though I'm at that building on every Friday and left at 5.55 and the meeting started at 6. So, so yeah, so, uh, you know, even the, uh, one of the leaders needs to know that calendar and even a reminder. So what are some benefits, again? You've heard a lot of little comments from me, but feeling less isolated. I think lipedema is probably somewhat of an isolated uh, disorder that women who have it um, uh, feel, I guess, I, I don't know a better word, isolated. So feeling isolated or different is common when dealing with clinical problems. And gathering with others who are facing the same challenge is a way to decrease the sense of isolation. And participants in support groups often comment about not feeling so alone. Another benefit, receiving practical information based on personal experience. There's not as much scientific data about um, all the herbal medications that we talk about uh, or other uh, treatment plans. I'm, my specialty is really hematology, and when we deal with new drugs, we take care of 10,000 patients, and 5,000 get one drug and 5,000 get another one. We haven't, don't have that data and that information, so it's important that what one works for one person might not work for another, but at least share that. Or and if it does help, uh, for example, getting rid of those nightshade vegetables uh, for an evening snack, um, you know, maybe it works for, for you. So again, sharing information with patients who have similar issues has unique advantages. And information is often more practical or realistic about pantyhose. I can't, again, I, I go back to that, or support garments. So, so I, I think having the therapist out there and talking about what's available and then hearing what the women uh, know about it and even finding garments that are less expensive you know, some of these things can be hundreds of dollars. So um, I think all that hel is helpful, it's practical, it's realistic, and it comes from someone else who has a similar problem. And then receiving emotional support. I have many a times patients leave uh, crying uh, from their meeting with me, and I, I am pretty mean and I'm pretty harsh and yell and scream a lot, but I think sometimes it's that emotional support of knowing that you have something, you have a disease, and somebody finally recognizes it. But then, then what do you do after that? You go home and you think, now I've got this problem. There aren't a lot of things that we're doing, although there's a lot of excitement as th this meeting. So getting uh, peer support uh, in an ideal setting where we can gather with the purpose of receiving encouragement and affirmation. And most people have family and friends who could provide support. However, for various reasons, they may wish not to deal with them. Uh, this may be uh, due to a you know, feeling of needing of privacy. And it may be a lot easier to talk to someone who's a stranger or a relative stranger at, at a meeting uh, than someone in your family. And then receiving practical support as peer support groups relationships develop over time, many members aid each other in practical ways outside of the meetings. I know Anne comes with some of the other uh, patients to my office, I, and you know, maybe it's for transportation, maybe it's just for emotional support, but it's practical support too. Or giving someone a ride, or picking someone up, or going to the grocery store for them. It all um, is what makes membership in a group helpful. These are your friends, these are your family now. Now gaining insight in how to deal with a common problem. Everyone faces challenges in life. This is a quote from Happy to Inspire. Uh, it's a matter of how you learn to overcome them and use them to your advantage. In most support group meetings, attendees talk about how they are trying to cope with a common problem or challenge they are facing, and they listen to other attendees who have the same issues. These discussions often give them better insight into their own challenge as well as improved strategy 
for coping with the challenge, very important. In gaining broader insight into yourself and your life, members may see themselves more clearly by listening to others who have the same situation. And then gaining a greater sense of control over your problem. Improved insight and coping strategy may result in members having a better sense of control in the face of the shared challenge. And this sense of control is usually associated with lower levels of stress, less anxiety and depression, and high rates of active coping and problem solving. And expanding or changing some of your social network. For those who become regular attendees of a support group, often these are their network of friends, expanding of number of people they feel supported by. And using your experience to help others. Support groups involve give and take. And most members come to value the experience of giving support as much as they do as receiving support. And they may find it particularly satisfying to use their difficult experience to help others, turning a past problem into something of value. And then building relationships and trust. Support groups can be a place where members learn that there are other people out there who are supportive and trustworthy. Some have few opportunities to develop relationships with others whom they can trust, and the chance to do so can be a life-changing experience. So what does a healthy peer support group look like? Communication, connection, trust and acceptance, acceptance wanting to be together, self-disclosure, giving and receiving support, and movement and exploration. Communications, members typically talk with each other before, during, and after the meeting. When I leave, they're still talking, and uh, they may be there till the next meeting. I don't know sometimes, but they do, uh, send to do tend to do that. And members communicate about shared interests for connection and experience beyond the central theme of the group. Uh, members show evidence they are actively listening to each other. Members are happy to see each other and happy in each other's presence. That's connection. And trust and acceptance. Members share their unique experiences and personal differences. And members recognize and appreciate the common and unique experience of others. And they take risk in what they share and do because they trust and care about each other. And wanting to be together. Members want to come to the meetings and be with the other group members. Comments are often made about looking forward to coming to the meeting and express disappointment if they can't attend. And spend time outside of the meetings and members feel that they may make a significant contribution to the group and that their participation matters. And self-disclosure, if trust levels are high amongst the members, they'll take more lives, uh, take, talk more about their lives, not take more lives, sorry. <laughs> Uh, talk more about their life's struggles and successes and part of their experiences they don't understand. And the, they, they, should be they, may also talk about what is going on in the group, including their feelings and conflict with other members if their feelings are hurt or not supported. And giving and receiving, if functioning well, most members will be involved in receiving and giving support. And support may come in the form of strategies relating experiences, or expressing care and concern. And if there's a good level of trust, members will be more willing to talk about topics that are confusing or threatening to them. So this is Cleveland, beautiful downtown Cleveland. I think it's a pretty good looking city nowadays. And this is our support group, and there's Anne. Anne, do you want to stand up for everyone so I can give you a hand? I know you don't want to, but yeah, thank you. So um, to me, it's been a very rewarding experience. I look forward to it. Uh, once a month on Fridays, and thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> oh, questions, uh-oh. Yeah, we have time for a couple questions, no, no, too. I should, have, I should have slowed my talk <laughs> down a little bit. <laughs> one question is, a, a member was sharing that they've had wanted to start a group, but they often can't find names of others to start the group because of privacy reasons. Uh, well, um, yeah, I suppose, but you have to ask um, your, the physician, perhaps, if you ask the physician dealing with that, he or she could ask the patient mm -hmm. if it would be okay to share. And I always, I ask the patient, so I'll say, you know, we have a support group here uh, once a month on Friday. If you're interested, let me know, and I will connect you with um, the group leader. And, and if, you know, in that situation, I think I'm covered. Okay. okay, and one final question. How do you find a knowledgeable leader so it doesn't turn into a gripe group? 
Yeah, that's, that's really a, a good question. Um, um, I'm not sure that I have a, a good <laughs> answer for that. I mean, your leader should be um, impartial, someone that has a kind of easygoing personality, not someone that could uh, strike out at individuals. So, um, and if the leader isn't good, you can always get rid of that leader and tell them they, <laughs> they, can, they don't need to come back again. So, I mean, I think you have to be honest. That's what a group is. You, you share, and the group might come together and inform that person that, uh, hey, you're not really doing a good job as leadership, and then that individual has to look at themselves and see if they can improve, if they're interested in staying with the group. Okay, well thank okay. you very much, Dr. Okay. Bartholomew. Thank you. And Dan.